What's up, everybody? Thanks, as always, for supporting the show. It would mean a lot to me if you would take a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel, and then follow me on social media on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter so you guys don't miss any of our content over the course of this season. All right, let's talk some basketball. All right, let's move on to our power rankings. Number 10, the Phoenix Suns. They lost Drew Eubanks, Eric Gordon, Nasir Little, David Roddy, and Thaddeus Young. They added Ryan Dunn, a late first-round pick who's looked pretty solid in his summer workouts, kind of an interesting young player. Tyus Jones the and, and Monte Morris, the much-talked-about point guard upgrades that the Suns have been clamoring for. We're going to talk a lot about that concept today. And then they upgraded their backup center position, obviously turning Drew Eubanks into Mason Plumlee, who's just a bigger, better athlete, just a better backup center than Drew Eubanks was. So let's start with the point guard concept. How much do the Suns need a point guard? It's a complicated topic because Devin Booker and Kevin Durant are both really high-level playmakers, in my opinion. But playing point guard goes a lot further than just playmaking. The Suns were specifically struggling with ball pressure in the Wolves series. So they averaged over 14 turnovers per game. That was the third worst mark among playoff teams. They gave up 20 points per game off of turnovers. That was the worst among playoff teams. And even on possessions where they didn't actually lose control of the basketball, they often struggled to get into their sets until late into the clock. They constantly looked rushed. They constantly looked out of sorts. And then all you got to do is look at the offensive rating and realize that they were really struggling to score the ball against Minnesota, right? So having a professional point guard who has spent every day of his life navigating ball pressure and getting a basketball team into their offense, that would certainly help things, right? Those types of players, the Tyus Jones types, the Monty Morris types, they've just been facing physical ball pressure since they were kids. It's all they've ever done. Whereas Devin Booker and Kevin Durant are scorers that have also learned to play on the ball, that have also faced a good amount of ball pressure, but that's not necessarily like what they've grown up doing as basketball players, right? Guys like Monty Morris, guys like Tyus Jones, they don't get rushed. That's their that's their superpower as point guards. They were, they're going to methodically navigate ball pressure and get you into the half court and get you into your stuff. Here's where that gets tricky, though. That's kind of the only benefit the Suns need from a point guard. Once they actually get into their stuff, you want KD and Devin Booker with the ball. They're incredible playmakers. You want them running your ball screens. You want them coming off of your dribble handoff. So it's tricky. And the thing is, is that Tyus Jones is probably going to start. In his press release, he specifically used the phrase starting point guard. He also said, quote, the Suns opportunity is where I can best maximize my value for a return to free agency next year. It's very clear Tyus picked Phoenix because he thinks he's going to win a lot of games and go on a playoff run, but also have a large role as the starting point guard. That's part of the agreement that was made to get him to take a veteran minimum deal to go to Phoenix. So he's probably going to start and play a lot. And that is a large role to give to a player that essentially ties you into a three-guard look simply so that you can handle ball pressure better. And here's the thing. I do believe in three-guard looks as long as you have a very physical, imposing front line. We were just talking about this with Memphis. I think Ja and Marcus Smart and Desmond Bain can all play together because you're playing Jaron Jackson at the four next to another massive center that can kind of offset some of the size limitations of that backcourt. Team USA is a great example. You're playing Steph Curry, Devin Booker, and Drew Holiday. It's three guards, but you have LeBron James and Joel Embiid or LeBron James and Anthony Davis as the front line. That offsets the three-guard concept to a certain extent, right? Especially in the small sample when LeBron's actually playing hard. Kevin Durant and Yusuf Nurkic are not that type of front line. They, they're going to have a lot of pressure on them this year to play big, to be big and physical, to battle on the glass, to do a lot of work on that front line. And it's just a lot to ask. I do think Tyus will really help on the offensive end. A lot of possessions in the Minnesota series died in the hands of Royce O'Neal or died in the hands of Eric Gordon, died in the hands of Josh Okoji. They'd bring him into the action as they were constantly trying to hunt hunt like Carl Towns or Mike Conley, and those guys would hedge and recover. There'd be a little delay in the switch, and they'd swing it over to one of those guys, and the possession just would fall apart for their, from there because they couldn't capitalize on it, right? Tyus Jones will get them up the floor into their stuff, and he will be better at taking advantage of the openings that come, uh, come his way after 
he gives away the basketball. He shot 49% on unguarded catch and shoot threes last year, 49% field goals. So he makes half of his open threes. He has a nasty floater that he hits over 50%. He finishes well at the rim for a guard. All of that's good. He's not the deadly high volume three point shooter that Grayson Allen is. But I think the ball handling improvement is enough to make it an offensive upgrade. Maybe not a massive offensive upgrade, but it will be somewhat of an offensive upgrade. But it's just also possible that this shift in the way you're deploying your resources opens up a bunch of other issues. Tyus is not a good rebounder. He's not a guy that's going to move the needle for you on the defensive end. And so again, like it might be a marginal offensive upgrade. Again, don't don't underestimate Grayson Allen in this role here because like, what he was doing setting ghost screens and just being a fucking laser from three was a huge part of their offense last year, right? And Tyus Jones is a guy that can knock down wide open catch and shoot threes, but he's not a guy that's going to be sliding his feet and quickly getting – he's not a movement shooter the way that Grayson Allen can be, right? So, like, I do think it's an upgrade overall, but, like, it's just a big role to devote to a player that gives you a marginal offensive improvement while not so- solving the real issue. So what is the real issue? What went wrong versus Minnesota? Bradley Beal, Devin Booker, Grayson Allen, Kevin Durant, Yusuf Nurkic was a great lineup all year. There were 21 lineups in the NBA that played at least 300 minutes. Those guys at plus 11.1 points per 100 possessions ranked fourth out of 21 lineups. They had a 125 offensive rating, but they got absolutely thrashed by Minnesota. So what happened? It mostly came down to physical domination. Some of it was the ball pressure stuff we were talking about, right? Like, just they, that same lineup had a 93 offensive rating versus Minnesota. Couldn't score. 125 in the regular season, 93 in the playoffs. Too many turnovers, too many possessions that started too late in the shot clock. It just wasn't working. But the physical domination went way deeper than that. They gave up an offensive rebound on 39 0.2% of Minnesota's misses. Almost 40% of Minnesota's misses ended up back with Minnesota. That was dead last among playoff teams. They also only rebounded 21% of their own misses. That was third worst among playoff teams. So they weren't getting any of it back on the offensive glass on the other end. They got thrashed in the paint. They gave up 51 points in the paint per game. That was the second worst mark among playoff teams. Then we talked about turnovers earlier. Just They gave up the most points off of turnovers out of any of the playoff teams per game. And the real damaging piece was their defense was just awful. They allowed Minnesota, by the way, who was 17th in offense in the regular season, who consistently looked terrible on offense against both Denver and Dallas. Phoenix allowed those guys to score 123 points per 100 possessions. It was by far the worst defensive rating among playoff teams. Guys were constantly getting worked off the ball. They were getting back cut, getting ran by for offensive rebounds. They weren't picking up in transition at all. I'm going to show you guys a sequence from game four, an elimination game, where they just straight up forgot to guard their man three times in four possessions and gave up a bucket on every single one of them. And again, this was a bad Minnesota offense, and they shredded Phoenix. So we can talk about point guards and we can talk about ball pressure and offensive talent and all those things all we want. But they lost to Minnesota because they got bullied physically. And the concerning part is all year long, I talked about Phoenix as a team that was thin and that would struggle to win rock fights in the postseason. And that ended up being their downfall. They ran into a bigger, stronger team, got punched in the mouth, and they wilted underneath that. And I don't see how anything that they did over the summer can address that issue. They will inevitably run into a team. Even if it's not Minnesota, they will inevitably run into a big physical team that pushes them on that level. And they're going to have to rise to that equation, uh, that uh, occasion. So how does Phoenix unlock their full potential relative to their talent? To me, it comes down to two things. One, they have to be willing to do the work to win ugly. The Suns played some of the prettiest basketball in the league last year when they had it going. If so much offensive skill on the floor, some beautiful advantage basketball, some beautiful drive and kick possessions, right? But inevitably, they're going to run into a Minnesota or a Denver or a different Western Conference team that will drag them down into the mud. They have to be able to win games like that. That means taking the defensive end of the floor seriously from day one, 
You can't be making elementary school defensive mistakes in an elimination game because you're not serious on that end of the floor. Some of these mistakes I'm going to show you are laughable. Like, all I talked about them not picking up in transition. Those were on made baskets. Wait till you guys see these clips. They're crazy. You can't be getting sliced and diced by a mediocre offense like Minnesota. The second piece of that is winning 50-50 balls. You were 20th in defensive rebounding in the regular season, so I'm not surprised that you struggled to defensive rebound. You couldn't defensive rebound all year, so of course you struggled against Minnesota. And all of the, that, that is going to take a buy-in down the roster. All the stars, all the role players actively pursuing the basketball whenever it's available, being willing to get down and get dirty. That's number one. Really comes down to they have to be willing to do the work to win ugly. Secondly, on the offensive end, they got to play advantage basketball. The Suns were at their best when they were moving the ball around. Their assist rate, this was a crazy stat, their assist rate was 6% higher in wins compared with losses. It was one of the largest disparities in the league. I looked around, most of the teams are like 1% or 2% different. 6% higher in wins than losses. When they hunted advantages and played drive and kick, they looked better. There's an interesting conversation to have about the running of sets. This was something that we uh, heard from KD after the Serbia game, right? He talked about how, like, oh, you know, it was really fascinating. We didn't really run anything down the end of that game. We just trusted each other, and we just played basketball. And here's the thing. That Serbia team, that was real high-leverage basketball. That Serbia team was legit. They punched Team USA in the mouth and brought the absolute best out of them in that fourth quarter. They're not Minnesota on defense. And against that Serbian team, playing kind of freelance basketball was enough because they were able to consistently get enough advantages just by playing basketball. But when you're playing against really, really, really dominant, athletic, massive defenses, you're going to have a harder time finding those advantages. And so to Katie's point, like, I, I agree with him that like you don't necessarily have to call plays or run intricate five-man action to run quality offense as long as you're able to get an advantage. But against teams that are not giving much in the way of advantages, that have the talent to make things harder on you, you have to find a way to make things harder on them. And the way to do that is to run more three-man action, to run more side-to-side, -side, getting multiple interchanges on the same possession, running off-ball action, making it at least harder for the defense to do what they're doing. And so, to Katie's point, it's about balance and about understanding time and situation. Okay, we're playing really good in the flow right now. Let's stick with it. Or, hey, guys, we're playing in the flow and we're really struggling to get advantages. This isn't working. This is where we have to settle down and run our stuff, right? And kind of feeling that out is a big part of what makes a successful basketball team. Generating more quality three-point looks. The Suns were 25th in three-point volume. This is also a delicate topic because you can't just take threes for the sake of taking threes. They need to be quality threes. I, I tweeted this stat out this morning. Eight of the top 12 three-point attempt teams per game missed the playoffs last year. Eight out of the top 12. So there's no proof that if you just take a ton of threes, you're going to win games. Now, interestingly enough, the top two teams in three-point volume were Boston and Dallas, and they actually went to the finals, right? But just go back one previous year, and it was like Miami was 10th and Denver, I think, was 25th. So there's no real correlation there necessarily. But there's a mandatory minimum, right? Like just because you don't want to be jacking up threes for the take of for the sake of jacking up threes doesn't mean you shouldn't be looking for opportunities to try to generate more quality threes. Because again, if we're looking at shot diet, quality rim attempts are by far the most valuable shot in basketball. It's not close. That's that will always be the best shot in the game. Quality rim attempts. But the next best thing is a quality three-point attempt. And so if you can find a way to turn some of the other things, contested rim attempts, contested threes, mid-range shots, post, st post moves, any anything that is not one of those two things, if you can find a way to convert some of those possessions 
into more high quality rim attempts or more high quality three point attempts, you improve the efficiency of your offense, right? So again, it's not about just hunting threes for the sake of hunting threes. It's about hunting the best possible shot on every possession. Jet, like So for instance, if I'm looking for more catch-and-shoot opportunities for KD, Devin Booker, and Bradley Beal, who shot over 40% from three last year, if I'm looking to hunt more three-point shots for them, I need to get into drive and kick more often, right? Because if I'm running two-man game, and I'm taking a lot of pull-up jump shots, I'm not going to get into that driving kick very much, right? So that is a concerted effort from the team to identify when you see an opportunity to uh, for a closeout, right? Okay, I'm running this action. They're sinking in a little bit off of Bradley Beal on the left wing. Swing it to Bradley Beal. He rips to the left. He's got that baked-in driving lane because that defensive player is closing out on his right shoulder. He gets into the lane, draws another defender, throws a kickout pass. Now Devin Booker has a closeout. He beats that dude off the dribble. Now KD is standing wide open at the top of the key. Throw it to KD. He knocks down the three-point shot, right? You generate a high-quality catch-and-shoot three for KD by turning maybe a handful of those pull-up jump shot possessions into more drive-in kick possessions. Now, to be clear, you got to take a certain amount of pull-up jump shots to keep the defense honest, right? Because... That's how Phoenix gets teams into rotation. They're not a rim pressure team. They're not driving to the basket a lot. They get defenses into rotation because you're terrified of Devin Booker, Kevin Durant coming off of these screens and shooting. So the big comes up to the level. You're going to see some examples of that in the film, right? And the only way you're going to get the big to come up to the level is if you demonstrate that you can knock down that pull-up jump shot. But it's about balance. If you're, I can't remember exactly how many they took off the top of my head. It's something like 23, 24 pull-up jump shots a game. If you're taking 23, 24 pull-up jump shots a game and you cut that down to 2019 and those all become high-quality rim attempts and high-quality catch-and-shoot threes, that's a way to squeeze a few more points per 100 possessions out of your offense. So again, like it really just comes down to playing the right brand of offense. Trusting each other, making those kick-out passes, playing drive and kick, which generates more catch-and-shoot three-point shot opportunities which is going to increase your overall shot volume, right? And then lastly, looking to run sets, especially against elite defenses when your freelance attack isn't working as well. Those are the main driving forces behind improving Phoenix's offensive resilience. We know in the large sample they can score, but we got to find a way to avoid those really ugly stretches like they had against Minnesota. So again, have to find a way to do the work, be willing to do the work, in playing advantage basketball, playing better and more efficiently on the offensive end of the floor. I I have the Suns as another one of the middle of the pack teams out West. I think they'll probably stay above the plan, but they will generally be a part of that race, kind of like they were last year. So think of them, I have them in like that five to eight range. And they'll have to have a lot of things go right for them to win the title, right? Like they'll need to get some favorable matchups. They might have to have a couple of other contenders get knocked out either by injuries or by upsets. And they're going to need to shoot the ball really well. They've got some gaping holes that can get them beat. But so does everyone else around the league except for the top four teams. So that's kind of the definition of this tier. And it's going to be the same for every team until we get to number four. They're all teams that are capable of winning the title, but they need some things to go right. They need some luck. And they are very beatable, if that makes sense. All right, let's get into some film. Only nine clips today. Not going to go too crazy. So this uh, first clip, it's an example of some five-out action um, to just give you an example of how you can make yourself harder to guard by shifting from side to side and by running uh, multiple interchanges in the same possession. So we're going to start by Bradley Beal handing it off to De- uh, to Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant's going to run into like a dribble pitch with Devin Booker, okay? Here's the, the dribble pitch Devin Booker generates just a tiny bit of separation with between Jaden McDaniels and Devin Booker, right? Now Devin Booker he sees Yusuf Nurkic flashing. This is all part of the set. He's going to throw the ball to Yusuf Nurkic, okay? Now at this point, Nurkic is going to look at Beal to basically fake like he's going to run a dribble handoff there. But then Beal is actually going to fake and cut back in to screen Jaden McDaniels. He screens Jaden McDaniels, which puts Jaden into a chase position which allows him to get a little bit more separation into the dribble handoff with Yusuf Nurkic, this forces Gobert to come out to the level. 
if Jaden is attached, Gobert can sit back because Jaden is not attached. Gobert has to come up. Gobert has to contain Devin Booker. Now Anthony Edwards has a decision to make. He can either stay out on Bradley Beal or he can watch Yusuf Nurkic. He stays out on Bradley Beal. There's the pass from Booker to Yusuf Nurkic, wide open dunk. Now, obviously, Carl Anthony Towns could, in theory, come over and tag. But if he comes over and tags, that's where Yusuf Nurkic could either make the extra pass to Booker or to Durant, excuse me, or Booker can throw a over the top, uh, like a two handed over the top pass that hits Kevin Durant. Now he's got a wide open three. So again, you get a wide open dunk out of a complicated interchange. This is an elite defense that makes freelance basketball pretty damn hard. And by running a set, you made more things that Minnesota could mess up. More opportunities for mistakes. They made a mistake. You end up getting a dunk out of it. Here is two possessions later. And Bradley Beal, off of a made free throw, is just going to dribble up the floor and take a impossible contested step back dump shot over Rudy Gobert. That's the kind of thing that has to be kind of like taken out of this Phoenix offense. You need to take a certain amount of pull-up jump shots. They keep the defense honest, but they need to be part of the larger goal that you're trying to accomplish. So if you take a pull-up jump shot coming off of a ball screen because Rudy Gobert is not up high enough, now if you take and make that jump shot, you're making Rudy Gobert think about what he needs to do in that coverage. You're not making anybody think about anything. When you take a transition step back jump shot along the baseline with a bunch of time on the shot clock for no reason. That's the type of opportunity that needs to be turned into a quality offensive possession for Phoenix. Here's another example of, uh, uh, I, I put this clip in here just because I wanted to show the kind of setting of the stage of, uh, of how you can create openings on the back line uh, or openings for pull-up jump shots by targeting the uh, whatever coverage they're using. So as we saw in the first clip, Rudy Gobert came up uh, to show on Devin Booker and Nurkic slipped behind, right? Here's another example. Off-ball screen, right? We have Nurkic screening down on Carl Towns. KD comes up. Gobert shows. So does Cat. Slips. Nurkic gets another layup. Another dunk, right? Okay. So that is the, the uh, setup for this next play. Gobert has now gotten burned twice for coming up to the level. So on this possession, watch Gobert. Nurkic sets the ball screen. I'm going to slow it down a little bit. Nurkic sets the ball screen. Ant dies on it. Gobert's up, but now he's seen Nurkic beat them on this slip twice. Watch Gobert take a hop back. He's like, oh shit, I got to get back. The reason why he's got to get back is those two dunks that Nurkic just had. That is what develops this opening for Devin Booker to take a wide open pull-up three off the dribble. Again, that's the type of pull-up jump shot that you want to take. You want to take it as a coverage beater so that you can consistently pull Gobert up to the level so that you can get the defense in rotation and generate openings. That is the order of operations you need in order to maximize this offense. All right, the uh, here's I'm going to show you guys some examples of the bad defense that I talked about. So here we go. Made basket. Suns have, uh, I think, KD just hit a corner three. Transition possession. No one's matched up. Jaden's up the floor. No one's guarding Mike Conley. Jaden grabs it. Now Nurkic is sinking back. Throws to Conley. Conley pump fakes, gets into the lane, drops it off to Gobert. Easy layup. You just gave up an easy rotation situation off of a made basket. That cannot happen. That is an inefficiency that needs to be closed up. Very next possession. This is a made basket. No one's back in the paint. Remember, when you're in transition defense, you stop the ball, you stop the basket. No one's back in the paint. Ant just takes a hard right-hand driving move by Bradley Beal. The defense isn't loaded up. He gets a layup. That's bad defense. Two possessions later. On a make. No one is guarding Anthony Edwards. Phoenix just scored. No one is guarding the best player on the other team who just steps into an easy three. This is all in an elimination game consecutively. 
Like th- that's just setting yourself up for failure. That's how you give up a 123 offensive rating to a bad offense. And and, and so that, that's the again, that's the level of seriousness and discipline that Phoenix needs to address at the start of this season. And had just hit a three, too, before that. Oh, I think this is a uh, this is a different bad transition defense possession. Ant had just hit a three on the previous possession, a corner three. Look at this jogging. No one's getting matched up. And they just let Ant walk into an easy three. Just it hit one. It just like, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. This is a man-to-man look. Look at this possession. Man-to-man. We're dribbling over his ball screen. Bradley Beal's doing this weird thing where he's like not double teaming Ant, but he's kind of like just standing in the passing lane. And, uh, and sorry guys, still a little rusty on the film front. We're going to get a little better at it. Um, what's Roy Stone Hill doing up here? They're just like basically like soft triple teaming Ant. No one communicates. Katie starts pointing through to Nas Reed. Now KD decides to run through this weird triple team of Ant is there. Now Jaden McDaniels is going to get a wide open dunk. I don't. I, I watched this possession a bunch of times because I'm like, is that a zone look? I was trying to figure it out. Is that a zone look? I I, I don't think it's a zone. Why would Nurkic be up top? And they're following cutters through. This is just like I don't know what principles you're following here. This is just bad defense. So yeah, as you guys can see, it wasn't pretty. And so we can talk about the offensive end and getting a point guard and all those things, but it, until Phoenix becomes a serious basketball team in those details, they're not going to be able to win four playoff rounds. But they have the talent in-house. It's just got to be in a, a, something that they embrace from day one of the regular season. This team has to get a nasty streak. This team has to get a willingness to do the dirty work necessary to win basketball games. All right, guys, that is all I have for today. As always, I sincerely appreciate you guys for supporting the show. We will be back on Friday with another Power Rankings video as well as a mailbag. I will see you guys then.